Hello gorgeous people, this is Grace here by Cadonia, and this is the story of my grand tour of Kanchanaburi and how I did it all wrong. As you can see, this story is going to involve at least one dirt bike and the dirt bike is not being ridden, unless you kind of half close your eyes and use your imagination. Yes, absolutely doing it all wrong, but I did have a lovely time and I did still manage to get dirty. So let me tell you a little bit more about Kanchanaburi. This is the westernmost province in Thailand. It backs up onto Myanmar and it has some magnificent mountains, as you can see, without, however, having the benefit of the rather cooler weather we get up in the mountains of the north. I am told that Kanchanaburi is the second hottest place in Thailand, only after Duck, and Duck is just down the road. This wild and somewhat underappreciated province is home to some magnificent mountains, sweltering heat, the aptly named Hellfire Pass, and the infamous Death Railway. Now, if you aren't familiar with the history of the Death Railway, we need to step back to World War II to 1941 when Japan entered the war and quickly took over pretty much all of Southeast Asia. And in doing so, they took Singapore, they took Malaya, um, various military outposts of the Allies. And in those outposts, the Japanese took many, many, many prisoners of war. These prisoners of war were mostly British, Australian, Dutch and American and to them fell the unenviable fate of working as forced labour for the Japanese. Now, as the war progressed, the Japanese had supply line issues because of the volume of Japanese shipping which was getting sunk by Allied submarines. To solve this problem, it was decided to build a railway connecting Burma and Thailand. This meant building a railway through the almost impossibly wild and sweltering jungle of Kanchanaburi all the way up into Burma. And the prisoners of war became forced labour. And thus the Death Railway was built and earned its name from the sheer number of human lives lost in its construction. People died from overwork, from the terrible conditions they were subjected to, from malnutrition, from disease, from lack of medical care, as well as from violence and mistreatment at the hands of their Japanese captors. This is the infamous cutting at Hellfire Pass, where the railway had to be cut through the mountain. And this was done by labourers working in teams of two, one of them holding a metal pin and the other with a sledgehammer, boring holes into the sheer rock until the hole was deep enough to plant a dynamite charge and explode the rock. Hellfire Pass got its name because the workdays extended into the night, into the darkness, sometimes up to 18 hours a day, and this work in the darkness was lit by bamboo and oil torches, and the sight of so many malnourished, ill and dying men working in this flickering red light reminded people not unsurprisingly, of the fires of hell. It is a sombre sight of remembrance, and I spent time both in the war cemetery in Kanchanaburi, as well as walking the railbed, remembering the story of so many young men who lost their lives. As well as being a story of death, this is also a story of great courage and survival and is a deeply revered part of Australian military history. One thing I did not know before I came here, however, was just how many 
local labourers died alongside the prisoners of war. Now, approximately 12,000 prisoners of war are known to have perished on the death railway, but the number of local conscripted workers who were brought in by the Japanese from occupied countries such as Malaya, from Sri Lanka, also from Thailand itself. And these conscripted labourers suffered possibly even more than the prisoners of war because the prisoners of war had a structure of support. They had a pre-existing command structure and they had their own doctors as well who fought with the Japanese to keep as many POWs alive as they could. The locally conscripted labourers, the Ramusha, they had none of this. They were all on their own and they died in their tens of thousands. Tragically, we don't even know how many of these people perished as well. But it's estimated between 80,000 and 100,000 people. All of this to build a railway in the space of less than two years. They say that for every railway sleeper on that railway line, one life was laid down. Today, Hellfire Pass is a site of remembrance and it's maintained by the Australian government in memory of the Australian POWs and all others who died. And now for a massive change of pace. We are still in Kanchanaburi and it is a site of tranquility and peace. Here we have the famous Mon Bridge, which is the second longest wooden bridge in the world. And it connects the communities of the Mon people who live on one side of the river and the Thai people who live on the other. Kanchanaburi is replete with reservoirs which create beautiful oases of blue water in the midst of these sweltering mountains. It's so peaceful that these geese didn't even attack me and try to kill me, which surprised me immensely. And later on, when we got on this ferry, we found that the ferry came complete with ferry dogs. Yes, that's right. There were three dogs just chilling on the ferry with the ferryman, just riding backwards and forwards across the beautiful reservoir all day long. Now, looping back to how I was telling you that I was doing it all wrong. And here we go, dirt bike, but the dirt bike is on the truck. It is not being ridden. What a travesty. I had thought we were heading down to Kanchanaburi to connect with some friends who would be dirt biking, but it turned out that this didn't happen. So in the end, Myself and my friend ended up touring this fantastic part of the country with this poor dirt bike just watching from the back of the truck. Yes, that is a CRF 450RL and it's not getting any exercise at all. However, that is not to say that I didn't manage to get dirty, even if it was only as a spectator. Here we have some wonderful, wonderful dirty fun going on. Four-wheel drive buggies in the most insane obstacles you can dream up. They had two excavators on site to rescue the vehicles when they became impossibly stuck, which happened every now and then. Mostly, however, what goes on is it's a timed obstacle course and you have the driver and the co-driver, but the co-driver doesn't do navigation. That's not what they're there for. They're basically the winchman. So every time the vehicle gets catastrophically stuck, the guy has to jump out of the window and run with the winch lines and the snatch strap, find a tree, set up the winch and hopefully facilitate the extrication of the buggy from the bog. 
Often this meant they had to wade through the bog on foot first, and some of these bogs were literally waist deep. So by the end of the course, you could just see how tired these guys were getting. It was obviously a real workout. Spectating also turned out to be a bit of a workout because it's entirely up to you to make sure that you do not die. And that means don't get run over by an out of control vehicle. It means don't stand on the outside of the corner. And it means be very, very careful and make sure you're not standing somewhere where you're going to get decapitated by a broken snatch strap that comes flying through the air. So spectating was almost a sport in and of itself. Definitely nothing like going to a motorsport event in Australia or America. But don't let anyone tell you that safety was not a priority. Before any of us actually got into the event, we had to have a rapid antigen test for COVID to make sure that we were not COVID positive. So yeah, safety first guys, safety first. Speaking of COVID, the campgrounds up on the mountains were all empty. Look at this, this place is set up for hundreds of people and there is not a soul around. So the perfect time to visit if you like a bit of solitude. Anyway, eventually it was time to head back to Chiang Mai. But that doesn't mean that the fun is over yet. As you head back into Chiang Mai from the south, you pass this particular market where they have some very interesting food, such as these lively little grubs which are undulating gently in their container as they wait for your delectation. Apparently they are delicious, but at this stage I can neither confirm nor deny. The same goes for the very large and surprisingly expensive rats, which are also on sale to be turned into your Sunday roast. Now I am reassured that those rats, of which you just saw a very short, slightly gory clip, are not the rats that are running around your house. Apparently they are the rats which are running around your rice fields. And apparently that's good because they're supposedly more delicious, and I guess just conceptually more palatable. Anyway, again can neither confirm nor deny deliciousness, but I will be sure to let you know when I can. Stay awesome, I'll catch you later.